cliff in the American uh, the ta uh, fiscal cliff in the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. Um, so before we begin, just kind of want to touch on like how public finance, particularly as it pertains to the federal government, has been important throughout history. Um, I've got three quotes up here. Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1936 at Worcester, Massachusetts said, uh, the taxes are the dues that we pay for the privileges of membership in an organized society. The organized portion of that society being the government. Um, and so that kind of philosophy has really driven a lot of the American center left, the New Deal coalition, the Democratic Party um, to a large degree. Milton Friedman really influenced the post Barry Goldwater uh, Republican Party. Um, it was bad. As, so like what we see today in the Republican Party as it pertains to like fiscal philosophy is the idea of cutting taxes under any circumstance, for any excuse, any reason, wherever possible. And somewhere in the middle, I've quoted John C. Calhoun, who was vice president under Andrew Jackson, very famous Southern senator, um, right before the Civil War, was quoted on the floor of the Senate stating that the government at the time was deeply disordered, the credit of the country really impaired, the debt increasing, exp expenditures extravagant and wasteful, disbursements without efficient accountability, and taxes enormous, unequal, and oppressive to the greater producing classes of the society. Um, and so that is really still a debate today. Um, we saw that with the Trump, Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign and really this kind of contention uh, between left and right and our ways of approaching f uh, public finance. Um, this is really, it dates back to the uh, years of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton who fought over how the, how the federal government was really going to manage public finance. Um, that resulted in the creation of the First National Bank and the Treasury and whatnot, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so background for the American Taxpayer Relief Act is really the Bush years um, and of President Obama's first term. In 2001 and 2003, we saw two massive tax cuts across the board for most taxpayers. Um, so this really reduced government revenues. We have 9-11 and Afghanistan and Iraq basically really drive up government expenditures. Um, so we see kind of deficits ballooning up to 3% of the GDP by 2004. Um, deficits are slightly reduced a little bit after that, but after 2007, uh, because of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, the Trouble Asset Relief Program, and President Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, by 2009, the annual budget deficit reached 9% of the GDP. Um, in 2011, uh, Congress passes the Budget Control Act, uh, which really was kind of the, the form of American austerity, right? We have Europe cutting government expenditures um, greatly, and then we kind of mimic that, uh, trying to achieve some form of fiscal sustainability looking into the future, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so what was the fiscal cliff? It was a $500 billion fiscal contraction from both uh, the budget sequester uh, from the Budget Control Act and the expiration of President Bush's two tax cuts um, and then President Obama's alternative minimum tax patch and the tax cuts from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and the Affordable Care Act. Um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, just for like um, orientation, was, is kind of like a synonym for the fiscal uh, the stimulus package, um, which is, was, is what it was popularly known as. Um, so the, the average American family would have seen tax increases of $3,500, which is substantial given that the median, um, median household wage in the United States is about $50,000. Um, it would have cost the United States GDP between 1% and 6.8%, basically throwing the country back into a recession. So after all, the, all of the, I guess, improvements that have been made to pull the, the, the economy out of the recession and averting the depression, um, this really would have taken a hit on the economy and forecasters can't really say the entire economic impact this could have caused. So we have Congress, White House, um, and then lobbyists from different sectors and industries kind of like fighting over the micromanagement of like these specific uh, spending provisions and tax provisions. We have, I have here Timothy Geithner, who was Secretary of the Treasury at the time, uh, Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid and President Obama. Really, the main Democratic proposals focused on uh, keeping the budget sequester as was, 
the budget sequester was going to reduce uh, government spending $109 billion annually in both the defense side and non-defense discretionary spending. So Democrats didn't really want to touch the budget sequester. They really just wanted to raise taxes on the top 2% of wage earners. Um, and then the White House and the Treasury specifically uh, were negotiating with John Boehner, Speaker of the House at the time, to, to basically uh, limit the sequester to the extent that like the fiscal impacts, which was originally going to be $500 billion, uh, wouldn't be that, uh, wouldn't have such a huge effect on the economy. So they, they reduced some of those, um, they, they negotiated to reduce the budget sequester there. Um, Speaker Boehner and Harry Reid, pretty much mo a lot of, like I'd say like the core group of, of Republicans in the Senate and House, wanted to keep all of the book, President Bush's tax cuts, including for top 2% of wage earners, and really wanted to um, have, have the fiscal reform focus on the spending side. Uh, David Lee Camp, who was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, pretty much appears as like a consensus figure, and he proposes the American Taxpayer Relief Act. He decides to kind of embed the tax increases for the top 2% in the bill, and um, the agreement was reached that the budget sequester would be pushed from January 1st to March, um, January 1st being the date of the fiscal cliff coming into effect. And uh, there was also that agreement on tax increases for the top 2%. Um, the main lobbyists and like external actors in the industry were the healthcare industry, the defense industry, um, some colleges and universities, including like academics and energy. And mostly because of the sequester elements, uh, they were arguing against the austerity imposed by the Budget Control Act, but there was always all, all these specific tax uh, extenders and tax credits and tax cuts that um, specifically uh, the healthcare industry lobbied for and the energy industry lobbied for because they have, I guess, preferential, some forms of preferential treatment when it comes to um, their tax policies, um, mostly just fiscal incentives. Brinksmanship is one of the main things um, that we see happen in, uh, in the events of the American Taxpayer Relief Act, just meaning that both parties were really willing to kind of uh, play with play with the economy, play with like the integrity of, of, the, of American society. Now the good thing is that they did reach a consensus by that avoiding a second economic recession, uh, which would have been really bad. Um, and and they, they out, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the significance um, moving forward. So just just put simply, uh, the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts um, were extended for most taxpayers, excepting the top 2%. Um, unemployment benefits, some Medicare payments were maintained, some other forms of tax extenders were also maintained. The sequester was limited um, by, by about 20%. And uh, this basically, David Lee Camp and Boehner and the Republicans kind of proposed went with to facilitate tax reform in the next Congress. However, that still hasn't happened. Um, the, the act was still a little bit controversial among both parties for different reasons, amongst Democrats because they didn't want to cut spending as much as the Budget Control Act had done, and among Republicans because they wanted to keep tax cuts for the top 2%. Um, and then, yeah. So significance of the bill, primarily we averted the a second recession. Uh, also, it's important to note, and this is kind of like my main argument, why this is important is because it was passed in this hyper-partisan context following the 2012 elections, uh, where both parties were really at odds over fiscal issues. And we also implemented a schedule for budget cuts, so we did achieve some form of fiscal stability because of this. And that's important to note because the deficit has gone from that 9% of the GDP in 2009 to about 2.3%. So that's significant. It really is an improvement in our in, in the government's uh, financial state. And also, what I consider to be important is that taxes were raised on the rich. And this is a little controversial in general, but I note that this is important, not necessarily because of an ideological reason, but more so because both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were able to agree on the fact that 
the government has to be financed in some way, and not only does it provide a form of equity, but it also, it also from a pragmatic perspective, it has a, a, a beneficial impact on the government and how it maintains itself. And let's see, and the aftermath is, uh, we had the 2013 debt ceiling battle, um, the 2013 government shutdown also pertaining to fiscal issues. Um, but not so much a, a compromise or a consensus. Rather, both of, in both of these cases, these were kind of like crisis measures um, and tax reform, which hasn't happened yet. And so today, we still have a huge debt. We still have the government that needs to find ways to reduce the deficit, to keep our fiscal, our fiscal status um, positive, uh, to keep our, our treasury ratings at AAA so we can keep being able to finance our debt in the future. Uh, we don't want to lose our creditors to the international competitors such as the, the BRICS infrastructure uh, bank and whatnot. Um, we, we really depend on loans as a country to operate uh, and, that's not, and that's not inherently bad, it just is important how we, how we, how we spend money and how we raise money uh, as a way of actually keeping our government solvent. Um, so yeah, just it's an important question to ask. Are we living beyond our means? Where can we cut? How can we keep our government sustainable moving forward? Um, and I guess maybe we have time for a question or two if you guys have any. So. I have lots of questions. Sure. Um, okay. So I guess answering your final question, do you think that Canada is living beyond its means? So I think. So, for example, I have listed here public mismanagement, specifically the Department of Defense, right? The Washington Post published uh, an article a few months ago that the Department of Defense was wasting in, in lost, unaccounted for, $123 billion, which is a lot of money. So if that, is, if that happens in multiple sectors of the government, then, you, then this really accumulates, and that means that the government has space to cut where not necessarily because the programs are bad, not because government programs are bad, I don't think the military is a bad thing. Um, it's more so how are we managing it, who's managing it, and do we have really like the proper accountability uh, structures to to keep like our to, to make sure we that our taxpayer money isn't going to waste. So I think that in that sense, yeah, we are living beyond our means because the government really has not taken proactive measures to ensure that accountability. But I also think there are places where we can cut down on. Um, I mean, the defense being one of them, and there are there are other non-defense areas that the government can probably curb back on. Specifically, um, you know, there are there are departments such as you know commerce that are bloated that don't that don't do as much, and and I'm sure that there's space to cut there. And then also we haven't decided to pursue a tax reform that makes like sense. So we have a, a really complicated tax code where a lot of money is lost, particularly with the like super wealthy. So that's another space where the government should focus on, I think, um, to achieve like sustainability. Do you have a question? Um, about the world creditors still trust us, like is that um, actually an issue? Because um, is it trust in the American So yeah, it, it, for now, right? But this isn't really considering the fact that like entitlements are ballooning in the next years, right? To the point where it's not it's not like oh, uh, med uh, the Medicare trust fund or the Social Security trust fund are going to go defunct, right? It's more so the government is going to have to make up certain uh, certain expenditures through money that doesn't come in through the through the funding mechanisms of Social Security and Medicare which are the biggest government expenses. So by doing that, really what ends up being cut is discretionary spending. Once discretionary spending, once that discretionary spending budget like is completely cut out, then the government has no other option but to raise revenues, right? Or liquidate itself in order to be able to meet its international interest payments. The only reason we are we are like that currency of last resort, the only reason that people have faith in our government is because we're able to meet interest payments. And if we're not able to meet interest payments, then in, then in order to do that, in order to keep that triple A bond rating, which is that confidence in our dollar, 
we have to you know, monetize and liquidate assets, which in general just really makes the country poorer. So there has to be ways to address this moving forward. As of now, it's not a huge issue, but by two, 2047, the deficit is really going to, to make like, government expenditures unsustainable. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know if I have time for more questions, but I'm, I'm willing to answer as much as I can. So I'm sure you've been following the Trump administration. Do you see him taking measures that will kind of resolve these issues, or is he going the opposite way? It's hard to say because the Republicans don't seem really to be in agreement on what appropriate fiscal measures should be taken. So, like, for example, you have the infrastructure, the theoretical infrastructure bill that both sides have talked about, yet there's no, there are no bills in Congress. Um, the Republican, I've, I've read about Harry Reid saying that that's not even a priority for the Senate. And at the same time, the budget that was just passed makes no cuts anywhere overall, right? Because what was cut in, not in non-defense was increased in defense. So basically this budget didn't really add much to the deficit, but it didn't cut anything. So if that budget goes through and then you have another fiscal stimulus by means of infrastructure, which, uh, you know, there are plans and there are like, there, there have been ideas floated on how to finance that. That would at the end of the day, worsen the deficit because we would be operating on loans and not on tax increases. So that's and that's my opinion. Um, I, I I just don't think that the issue is developed enough to be able to say. All I know is that what has been proposed so far and you know the the Paul Ryan budget is is a cut to to non discretionary um, non military discretionary and. It, it increases that same amount in the military. So there really isn't a, sa a net saving there, uh, if that makes any sense. I, don't, I can't really say because the, the administration just hasn't proposed uh, something solid yet. But tax cuts paired with additional spending it, you know, results in deficit, so. Yeah. I guess it makes sense since he's a right-wing guy. Yeah, and, and more so, I think just, I think Trump, I don't know, I don't even know what Trump is from a left-right perspective, but I do know that he promised tax cuts <laughs> and infrastructure spending. And economic analysts that used to like talk about his plans in the campaign said that it would worsen the deficit, but I think they say that about everybody. So it's, it's just hard to say unless there is a bill in Congress and a plan um, on behalf of the administration. Well, are you talking about, so you, you're asking um, if the Obama stimulus package in 09 had been bigger, mm -hmm. we would have had, like, like, it would have been more difficult. It would have been more, um, um, we've been able to push out of it a little bit easier than. Are, are you talking about, like, the recession, or are you talking about the, the like, the, 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 um, the fiscal solvency issue? Um, I guess the, the recession. Well, yeah, I think I think if the, if the Obama stimulus package had been any bigger, I mean that's that, that's it was it was really big as it was, you know, in addition to the Bush stimulus package, with no, which no one really talks about that way. But I mean, it it, it put our our deficit the, at the biggest it's ever been since World War II. So if it were bigger, there would have probably been like a I'd say a stronger. Uh, response, economic response, so there maybe would have been more GDP growth, however, it's just hard to measure that because it didn't happen, and you always want to measure that in comparison to how the economy does overall, so you have to see, like, what's the marginal impact that extra spending would have had in extra GDP growth, and it's hard to say because it didn't happen. It just has, it's hard to say how, what, what the effect of the fiscal cliff would have been because it didn't happen. It could have ranged anywhere from 1% GDP impact to 7%. Both of those being very different things and having very different economic outcomes. And just a question on that the issue, um, I just don't really understand. So a lot of the projects under the Obama stimulus package were um, projects that were supposed to create jobs, like lots of jobs right away. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so they basically wanted people to come to the projects um, and know what they were doing, and it had to be on a very big scale. Um, how like, sustainable is that? I, don't, I just don't understand the sustainability of, like, of the of the stim Well, so the, the, the stimulus package had like multiple components, and one of them was, was that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they, you're, you're right, they were asking for like shovel ready projects. So it, it had an impact, it really had a regional impact where there were shovel ready projects, where state governments specifically had like already had, I don't know, say like a highway plan in place or a, I don't know, a, a, a train plan in place. A lot of money went to that. But most of the, most of Obama's, Obama's stimulus package was really focused on like state governments being able to maintain operations, so like firemen, police, um, parks, ever, anything with like uh, a public employment um, like okay. aspect, that was really what the stimulus package was directed to. But wherever there were infrastructure ready projects, some, some money went to that. That's something that, you know, it's, I guess that's like the, the, the trap of federalism, where there are kind of like activist state governments, the Northeast, uh, has had a lot of like you know public investment from the state side, but at least the South, for example, has not seen that. So you have kind of like uh, an I imbalanced uh, impact there. Uh, but that that that's uh, that was a little bit beyond. That's kind of like a little bit beyond what I focused on here. I was I'm, I I mainly focus on like the, the budget sequester. So whatever <laughs> whatever Obama increased in terms of money, um, you know, 2011 comes and. Government's trying to reel that, reel those funds in. But any, I don't know. Any last questions? Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Let me get out of your way.